So now we're going to dive right into writing second species counterpoint and give some rules to get you started. So first, we're going to talk about how to begin a second species counterpoint. If you're writing the counterpoint below, you have two options. The first is to begin on the strong beat, and the second is to begin on the weak beat, and both of those would be on do, on the octave. Beginning your example on arrest is actually a really nice way to highlight the independence of the contrapuntal lines. If you're writing your counterpoint above, you actually have six different options. You can begin on the strong beat on scale degrees 1, 3, or 5, or you can begin on arrest and then on the weak beat you would start again on 1, 3, or 5. Now let's discuss how to end a second species example. If the counterpoint is below, you have two options. The first is just like a first species. So your penultimate bar would be a whole note on scale degree 7, moving to scale degree 1. Alternatively, and perhaps a little bit more common, is to end with two half notes moving to a whole note, and the half notes would be sol, ti, do. So if it's below, it's scale degree five, seven, and then one. So if you're writing your counterpoint above, you have two options as well. Uh, the first is half notes, scale degree six, seven, and one. Of course, if they're in minor, that's raised, so la, ti, and do. And the other option is, of course, to have a whole note on scale degree 7 in the penultimate or second to last bar. As we begin our discussion of second species, what I hope you'll notice is that second species is really just building on the rules and guidelines we've already discussed in first species. So for instance, our treatment of perfect consonances is still governed by a strict set of rules. In first species, parallel perfect intervals are strictly forbidden. In second species, parallel perfect intervals are also forbidden, but there are a few more scenarios we need to consider. Parallel perfect intervals across a bar line, that is from weak to strong beat, are not permitted. Parallel perfect intervals are also not permitted, however, from a strong beat to a strong beat. So that's from the downbeat of one bar to the downbeat of the following bar. You may not have uh, consecutive perfect octaves or fifths. And the reason for that is because the placement of these perfect intervals on the strong beat, the metrically stronger beat, draws our attention to them so that we hear these intervals almost as if they are consecutive. You lose that intervening uh, half note and hear only the consecutive downbeats. So as you might suspect, if you have two consecutive octaves or fifths on weak beats, that's perfectly permissible. And in fact, having this consonant stepwise motion, the 6-5-6-5, six, five, six, five, is very nice, um, though you don't want to have uh, too many of those in a row. So now we need to turn to uh, direct fifths and direct octaves. I think there was some confusion about this, um, so I want to talk about them in both first species and in second species. A direct octave or fifth occurs when you move in similar motion to an octave or a fifth. That's all there is to it. If you move in similar motion to an octave or a fifth, you have a direct fifth which is not permitted. There is an exception to this rule, and that's if the upper voice is moving by step. That's an instance of a permissible direct octave or fifth. If the upper voice moves by step, um, then it's all right. In second species, as you might imagine, there are a few more scenarios, again, to consider. We have to think of, first, 
uh, from a weak beat to a strong beat, so directly across a bar line. And that's pretty straightforward. A direct octave or fifth across a bar line is not permitted. So moving from a weak beat to a strong beat in similar motion to a perfect interval is not permitted. Unless, of course, the upper voice moves by a step, in which case it's perfectly fine as it was in first species. Again, listen to it though. In two voices, uh, this still sometimes can sound a little awkward. But what about from a strong beat to another strong beat? So the downbeat of the first bar to the downbeat of the second bar is moving in similar motion to that octave in the second bar, all right? It actually depends. It depends on what happens in between. So in this case, that F on the weak beat provides just enough contrary motion across the bar line to make the motion, the similar motion from strong beat to strong beat okay. So this is a little bit different than when we talked about the parallel motion from strong beat to strong beat. Uh, that's not permitted because the parallel motion is so strong, whereas the similar motion um, is not quite as bad and therefore as long as you have something, a little something to add some contrary motion in there, you are okay. Now I want to discuss uh, the treatment of leaps. You already are familiar with the rules guiding treatments of leaps in first species, but I wanted to include these examples here so you could refresh your memory of what's permitted, what's good, what's bad, what's okay. In second species, the oblique motion within the bar brings us some new considerations. Now we want to limit our leaps across the bar line. It's not that you're not ever going to have any leaps across the bar line, it's that you want to leap primarily within the bar. And if you think about it, it makes sense. In species counterpoint, the main point is to have this independence of lines. The canis firmus is only moving across the bar line. So if we want to highlight that moment in the canis firmus, we want to not leap necessarily in the counterpoint because that detracts or distracts really from the canis firmus motion. And the other side is, of that is that when the canis firmus is completely still, that's a good time. Um, if you're going to leap, that's a good time to leap because there's nothing else going on. So just a few more points about leaps. Uh, just like first species, your melodic leaps must be consonant. And remember that perfect fourths melodically are consonant, so you can leap a perfect fourth. Um, so that's nothing new. Melodically, we must have um, consonant leaps. Harmonically, though, we now must also have consonant leaps. So if you leap from a pitch, um, both of the intervals that you create must be consonant. So here you see we have an octave and a sixth. Both of those are consonant, um, and that's the only instance in which you can leap to or from a pitch. And I now have some good news for you, which is that you ha now have two new leaps which you can use. Uh, the first is an octave that can be ascending or descending, and the second is a minor six, not a major six, but a minor six, um, which must be ascending. So all of the leaps that you could use before plus these two new ones are permissible. However, you still want to aim for a lot of stepwise motion. So primarily you will be using stepwise motion, though in second species there are more loops than in first.